Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Crypto Leviathan podcast. I'm your host, Dalibor, and today we have a very special guest. He is a trader, has been so for many years, and uh, he's recently started dabbling. Not recently, that's a mistake of mine. He's been in this space for quite a while, crypto trading, so I'll let you, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thanks. Uh, cool. To, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name's Adrian Reed. I'm the founder of Enlightened Stock Trading. Um, like you said, I've been trading uh, for a long time. I started trading stocks about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, my approach is um, systematic. Uh, so a lot of people try, you know, fundamental analysis, discretionary, technical, um, you know, looking at charts and combining those two things. I found pretty early on that any discretion in my trading basically just caused me to make uh, losses. And uh, I discovered uh, systematic trading after a couple of years of making losses. And then um, basically everything just clicked and turned around on a dime. And that's the way I've been doing it ever since. So uh, I've been trading full time since 2012 when I left the corporate world. And uh, I started um, sharing kind of my approach through Enlightened Stock Trading 2014. And, uh, and here we are. So I trade stocks and crypto now, um, both systematically. My crypto is fully automated. Um, so I just basically, I'm watching the computer over here on my on the side, just doing its thing right now. It's uh, running through its uh, program and um, that's that's the way it all works. So it's pretty pretty relaxed in the trading world nowadays for me because of um, basically, you know, automation and systemizing, systemizing everything. That's awesome. Yeah, I did say a short time, but then I realized crypto has only been around, you know, for five for a decade. And if you got into this space four years ago, that's a long time in the crypto space. But it's not a long time being a stock trader. So yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah, I've been trading forever. I was actually pretty slow to get into crypto because at um at my core, I'm pretty conservative, and I sort of looked at it in you know for many years as just being you know the wild west, crazy things going on, and scams and fraud and theft. And uh, really just resisted it. And I, I, I can't tell you how, how disappointed I am that I did resist it for so long because the, um, the systematic approach in crypto where you have rules that tell you exactly when to get in and when to get out uh, to get you above the emotion, uh, it just works so well. And uh, there's so much emotion in crypto and this week, no different. Um, so uh, yeah, overlaying a, a systematic approach to trading in, in this market has just been really, really good. Yeah, so let's break down some of those words that you said. You said systematic trading. And a lot of people, when you say automated or systematic, they think you're using a bot, you know, to buy and sell. Can you explain how your system works? And are you using a bot to trade? Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, So there's a couple of words that mean more or less the same thing. Systematic trading, trading system, algo trading, quant trading, uh, bot trading. A lot of it is very, very similar and just different phraseology. A... At the core of all of them is a set of trading rules that are absolute. If this and this and this happens, you buy. If this or this happens, you sell. Uh, so that's the entry and exit. And then you've also got position sizing rules. How much should I risk on this? Uh, where should I get out if I'm wrong, the stop loss? And where should I get out if I'm right, profit target? You don't always need a profit target, but you generally need everything else. So that's a, it's a, um, objective trading a uh, set of trading rules that tell you everything that you're going to do in the market. I call it a trading system. Others might call it a an algo. Um, the the difference, I guess, between algo trading and systematic trading is you don't have to automate system system trading. You can just have the rules on your computer. You press the button to run the test, and it tells you buy this today, sell this today. Algo trading implies fully automated. So you basically put the algo into the software it runs day in, day out, and you just monitor it. So that's sort of the, the distinction. Um, when you say bot, uh, particularly in the crypto space, there's a couple of really common bots out there, which are quite different to what I do. Um, for example, you know, one of them is like a grid bot that kind of trades as the price moves up and down and, and it takes, you know, dozens and dozens of trades within a certain range. Um, that's not really the way I work. I'm more of a um, a trend follower. So if a token is going up and the market is going up, then I'll buy it and I'll hold it until it starts going down, aiming to make massive gains, so big several hundred percent gains. Um, I also have systems which are mean reverting in nature. So if something is going up and it dips, chances are it's going to bounce because 
the trend is still in place. So you buy the dip and then sell the bounce. Um, that's quite different to the typical crypto buy the dip, which is it's down 30%, 40%, 60% buy the dip. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. It's just like little blips in a strong proven uptrend. Um, so you could call it a bot. You could call it an algo. Um, it's really just terminology. Really, it's trend following in crypto and mean reversion trading in crypto. And I have those rules um, automated so that my software and the exchange are linked through an API and that just runs the rules each day and places the trades for me. Awesome. Yeah, I was I was thinking a lot about this. And so essentially you mentioned two main strategies, mean reversion, which is basically if things go down, they must eventually balance themselves out or if things go up, they must eventually fall down. Same thing with trends. So how much, how much, how does it compare to, you know, just holding long-term, like let's say buying at this dip at negative 60% and versus using like your product or doing what you do, how do the returns compare? Yeah, good question. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is drawdown uh, and long-term a chance of success. And then we'll talk about the actual returns if that's okay. So um, in, in crypto, especially the, drawdown that you experience through buy and hold is gut-wrenching let's face it i mean in a in a bear market you could be down 60 70 80 percent and you could be waiting quite a you know a couple of years before the next rally and um, most people don't have the stomach for that and it's kind of inefficient use of your capital as well because you can make all of this money but then you lose 90 percent of 80 percent of it and then in the next bull market you've got to start from there and go back up right so it's tempting to look back at the last couple of years and say, oh, look, you know, the returns from buy and hold have been phenomenal. Look at if you bought Bitcoin at the beginning, look where you would be now. I mean, and yes, that's right. You would probably be a billionaire if you bought Bitcoin at the beginning. I didn't. I was very slow to the game. But the, tr the trouble is we, that's, that's past, right? And from where they all started down at the, you know, 0. 0.0000 something of a, of a dollar um, to now, we don't have that again, particularly for the, for the large caps. So relying on historical buy and hold returns in the future could be risky, right? We also don't know which tokens are going to win. You know, if you think it, about the beginning of any industry, you know, whereas the, a, a, uh, Whereas a world-changing technology, which this is, right, let's face it, I don't want to hype it up, I'm not that sort of person, but it changes things. But so did the automobile and so did the airplane. And if you look at those two industries, at the beginning, there was a massive proliferation of companies that did it. How many survived? Handful, right? A couple of handfuls. And if you buy and hold forever the wrong horse, you end up with nothing. And my, my belief is that most of the crypto tokens are inherently worthless and will disappear. Just like most of the airplane manufacturers disappeared. We basically have two now. I mean, maybe there's some others, I don't know, but, uh, and just like most of the auto manufacturers disappeared. Most of the cryptos that we've got currently got will also disappear. So if you buy and hold without an exit plan, apart from hold forever till it goes to the moon, you better be prepared to end up with nothing. So that's my starting premise for this. The return, the drawdown from buy and hold is woeful, terrible, woeful. You know, it's 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 painful, it's gut wrenching, it's long, and it's unnecessary. If you just have a good exit plan, and buy and hold long term returns, very speculative, because you don't know which is going to win the game. You can say, well, I'll just buy the big ones. So, Okay, but is Bitcoin really going to win in 10 years' time? Is it going to be the best technology? I don't know. You don't know either. Well, we don't know. So it's speculative at best. So that's where I'm starting from. If you add a systematic approach to crypto and just think about trend following, buying things that are going up, sell them when they start going down, you can make better than buy and hold returns with dramatically less drawdown. So you can beat the market and you have much less risk and you have much less time in the market. And to me, that's pretty attractive. So instead of an 80% drawdown from buy and hold forever, 
you might have a 30 or 40 percent drawdown which is much more tolerable still gut-wrenching but much more tolerable and uh over the long run you basically what happens is in the bull market you make a ton of money you give back a little bit instead of a lot and then you go to cash and at the next bull market you're starting from a higher base and so you grow better from there so your long-term compound return is much better yeah so my question around that is at least in Canada, you're, I know you're in Australia, when you're a day trader, the taxes are crazy, right? You Like the actual trading is income tax. So the argument from long-term holders is I avoid paying the gains because they're now capital gains. So when you take the tax consideration from trading, how does the return compare? Yeah, look, the difference, th this is something that differs across every jurisdiction, depends on how, of course, yeah. how you're taxed. And I'm not a tax advisor, so I, I, I can't really talk to you know, how do you get this tax, this level of tax versus that level of tax? In Australia, we have, you know, you could be a trader where it's income tax, or you could be an investor where it's more like a capital gain and the taxes are more reasonable. Um, look, after tax, the, the returns are clearly lower, but you've still got the massive benefit of much less drawdown. Um, and I also think you've, you eliminate or at least largely mitigate that long-term risk of, you don't know what's going to win. And if you don't know what's going to win and you're holding just so that you don't pay taxes on your gains and the thing that you're holding ends up the loser, then the after-tax return of trading is way better. Yeah, yeah. my rationale for it is kind of like, um, I'm willing to take you know steady cash flow that's a little bit less than speculating on something long-term. That's basically the rationale you're, you're trying to get, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I still, th I, to be honest, I haven't got the returns to hand to say, okay, on an after-tax basis with this level of trading tax, this is where you'd be versus if you were buy and hold forever. And I don't do that. I don't like to talk about it because- But everyone's just, different, right? In this case, because yeah. like, if you live in Dubai, it's like, there's no taxes. So I'm, right. I'm making way more money day trading, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly right. Um, but to me, the biggest thing is protecting your capital. This is really, really important because it doesn't matter how much money you make this year or next year or the next five years, if you lose it all, you've still got nothing. And so you have to protect your capital. And so even if you have to pay a little bit of tax, having a strategy that will get you out when the thing starts going down or when the market turns is going to put you in a place of safety and you're not going to give up all the gains that you've made. And um, a lot of traders think too much or spend too much time early on uh, focusing on how much am I going to make? How much can I make rather than how much could I lose and how do I protect from that? You protect the, the downside first. If, as long as you've got pretty good, you know, sensible rules, you get some upside. But if you don't protect the downside, then it doesn't matter how much upside you get. And that's absolutely the case, right? I'm going through that right now. Like what you just said, the drawdown and the... Um suffering because this is my first you know bear market i've been in, right. right because like if you're if you aren't older than 30 years old you've only seen a bull market right so yeah. so everyone who's young right now is experiencing this and uh, you're totally right you need preserving capital right now is the best because all these buying opportunities if you have no capital available how you, you can't make any money right now you can't capitalize on anything yeah exactly right the other the other advantage of being a trader is that um you can make money on the way down right if you um if you're nimble, you can still buy, make money from rallies, but you can also short sell and profit from the big downtrend. And that's sort of what I've been, what I've been doing. Um, so I uh, actually, I had a conversation with my, my son the other day because I managed his savings. Uh, I tried to teach him to do it. I explained all the concepts and everything. He's like, that's great. Awesome. You do it for me. Um, I was like, oh, okay, fine. He's only 15. That's, that's good. Uh, I just love the fact that he's saving and he's investing and he expects it to grow. Um, so, uh, he said, oh, you know, how's, how's our crypto doing? And so I showed him the chart of Bitcoin, which, you know, he entered pretty much FOMO'd in right at the top. He's like, dad, I've got this money. Can you put it in crypto for me? Manage it, whatever. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah, we'll do that. I didn't know it was the top. He didn't know it was the top. And then it started to drop. Um, and, uh, we had a few discussions early on where he was like, mm, we're still down. Oh, we're still down. But then the sh my short side system kicked in and started making money. And he sort of lost interest for a little while and came to me the other day and asked, how's it going? And I said, okay, cool. So remember, you started here. This is what Bitcoin did. This is where it is now. And um, you're up 26% and Bitcoin is down like whatever it was, 60%. 
He's like, cool. Wait, what? <laughs> How does that work? And so I explained to him short selling in, you know, basic terms, you basically borrow something from someone else, you sell it. And then when it drops, you buy it back and you give it back to the person and they've got what they had and you made money because of the decline. He's like, whoa, cool. All right, thanks. See ya. And he walked, yeah, he's out. So um, this is one of the advantages, I guess, of trading. You don't have to just buy and hold. You can make money from the way down. And the great thing about crypto is it's a very momentum-driven market. And so if you short the weak tokens when the market is declining, it's kind of hard not to make money. Just like if you buy strong tokens when the market is rallying, it's kind of hard not to make money. The hardest part is the exit points, right? When the market turns, right? No one knows where the top is. No one knows where the bottom is. And and uh, I assume also when the market is flat, that's a problem because it's like you're not really making much right? because there's not much swings in the market. So those are the three areas we're trading where you can get caught. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Um, the, the sideways volatile markets are pretty tough. Um, my approach is I, I have some mean revision strategies that will make a few trades here and there and will generate some profit. But in sideways markets, I'm much more in cash than I am invested in stocks as well. Same thing. It's just, you know, to try and catch tiny little moves, it's it's hard work and it's it's challenging. Um, so I stand aside a lot more unless there's a clear trend. Um, big problem that that many traders have is trying to pick the tops and the bottoms, trying to be right and say, oh, I got in and yes, I was right and it went up and I got out of the top. And it's a mindset trap because you don't actually have to pick the bottoms and the tops to make money. You've got to find a trend and you've got to get in and you've got to get out and make the difference. So you're just basically taking a chunk out of the middle of the trend or you're capturing a bit of a swing. You don't have to capture the whole thing. What you need to make that work is objective rules that you can test on past data to validate that, yes, those rules will actually capture some of the trend and give me a profit. When you try and think, okay, where should I buy XYZ token and where should I sell XYZ token? You're trying to kind of curve fit your decision to that one instrument, this one moment of time. And you're trying to subjectively pull information together to predict, but we can't predict. Like the market is not predictable. Otherwise computers would have won the game already, right? It's somewhat predictable. You can have a, po a positive expected outcome from your rules, but you can't predict the highs and lows of a particular token. And so you need to stop trying. This really helps. When I stopped trying to predict the highs and lows, the tops and the bottoms, and just said, okay, here's a set of rules. If I apply it to a whole big universe of tokens or of stocks, and I just run those rules day after day and keep taking entries and exits, it has a positive expectation of making profit. Then the game changes. You don't have to predict anymore. You just follow the rules. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a very good point, predicting tops and bottoms. No one can, even the experts in the industry can, you know, there's like maybe less than 1% of 1% that actually can make tons of money predicting the tops and bottoms. But most people aren't that special, you know? No. And I think you realistically, look, the people who really, happen to get tops and bottoms, most of the time it's luck. And maybe sometimes it's inside knowledge, which in crypto is probably legal. In stocks, it's not legal, yeah. right? Um, but generally it's a healthy dose of luck. And if someone says, look, I predicted the top and the bottom, great. How many things did you predict that weren't right? You know, and if you go back and you look at everyone's everyone's predictions, every single prediction that they made, you'll realize that most of the time it's random. And someone who's you know claims to have predicted the top of this and the crash of that and whatever, they probably made five thousand other predictions, but they're just hammering on that one because that was the one that was right. I always say that when people are calling for a recession, because they, there's people that have been calling a recession for a decade. I'm like, now you're right. For the last ten yeah, years, right. you were wrong. So <laughs> a broken clock is right twice a day in this scenario. Exactly right. Exactly right. And you have to. I mean, it's very easy to make predictions. It's very easy to try and call tops and bottoms. Making money is much harder. You know, to make money, you need to have a strategy which you can follow uh, consistently over time, which keeps you alive, which keeps the risk low, the, 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 the drawdown potential low, and captures some of the upside and uh, have the discipline to follow it. So how often do you need to adjust your system? Is it something that, you know, I, you adjust it once a year and put it away? Or is it something that you have to adjust weekly or daily to, in order to optimize it? 
Yeah, good question. Um, depends on the system. Um, for a very short term system, I will. They they generally have a shorter shelf shelf life. Um, it's just you know when the edge is small, they can quickly be eroded away. But if it was a trend following system that has a really big edge, then they last longer. Um, I will check. I check in on what my systems are doing, how they're performing very regularly. Like once a week, I'll have a look at the back test and say, okay, well, is it behaving as it should? as it should do, as I expect. But I won't adjust anything that regularly. I'll watch it over time. And if something is starting to shift in the market, like the edge is starting to decay, or there's been a shift from a bull to you know, sort of bear to a bull or vice versa, um, at, at big transition points, I'll start to look. Or if the stats start to erode, I'll, I'll have a look. Typically, three to six monthly, um, I would have a, a good look at a system and see if it's really working. Awesome. So what does your typical day look like as a day trader? Because I know a lot of people say it's glam, it's glorify, you know, you just put it away. <laughs> but in reality, I, I have a friend of mine who's in Dubai, he's on the computer 24 seven, you know, monitoring his portfolio. So walk me through like how it looks like. Um, It's way more boring than you would think. And for me, because it's because I'm not day trading in the traditional sense of like watching the screen and finding the buys and the sells and, and all of that. Um, my trading is dead simple. Um, I have uh, all of the rules coded into the computer, into the software. I just use off-the-shelf software. There's a few different softwares you can use. Um, my preference is Amy Broker, but there's there's several others. Um, each day, I download the data. Uh, in crypto, that's automated. Uh, so um, I'm downloading daily bars. I'm not trading on five-minute charts or 30-minute charts or anything like that. Um, so once a day at the turnover to the new daily bar, the computer opens up, downloads the um, the last day's bar, uh, adds that to the database. Then uh, I run the back test to see what new trades have been made, uh, so new entries on new exits. And my job as the trader is to replicate the back test. I want my account to match what the back test is doing. So each if I was doing it manually each day, I'd run the back test, look at the new trades, the entries and exits, and then go place them in the account. Um, that whole thing takes about 25 to 30 minutes, depending on how many systems you've got, if you're doing it manually. Um, my computer just did it. It's automated in crypto. That took about 10 minutes. Um, I've got a few things I need to speed up. It was running at about five minutes um, uh, a month or so ago, but I've changed a few things. I've added a few extra systems. So um, my trading in crypto is done. I don't have to do anything else now. All of the trades are already done. All of the record keeping is done. Um, my job as the trader is to come up with new system ideas to continue to diversify my account and to um, monitor the systems I've got to make sure that they're still solid. So uh, most of my time is spent dreaming up new system ideas, testing them, looking at my existing systems, trying to come up with ways of making them better, um, looking at the portfolio mix to, okay, well, uh, what would happen to my portfolio in this type of market conditions or in that type of market conditions and coming up with ideas to improve it. Much less time trading than you would think. Yeah, that's great because I know your strategy is a little bit different than like what day traders are. That's why I think more people would be open to something that you offer versus, you know, sitting in front of a computer, staring at charts all day. Many people don't want to be doing that. Well, and plus it's really hard. Like I've, I've tried it and it's stressful. It's very, very hard to make money. And um, you've got like, you can't do it if you've got a full-time job. So what do you do? Do you quit your job and hope you succeed at being a day trader when what, like 1% of people maybe succeed as, at day trading, probably less. So that's a high risk proposition. Most people can't do it. But systemized trading on daily charts, like what I'm doing, you can do that while you've got a full-time job and then just scale out of the workforce as the account grows. So that that's kind of compelling, right? It's a side gig or a hobby that makes money that can eventually become your main thing. And that's that's what it was for me. I um I traded for a long time before I left the corporate world. I had a pretty good, pretty well paid corporate career. I was enjoying it, but then eventually it just got to the point where my trading was making so much money and my job was so stressful. I was like, well, okay, time to just give the job away and I'll just focus on trading. It's more interesting. So let's talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about someone who's you know fresh out of university or fresh out of high school. They have maybe like five thousand dollars in savings. Um, how can they get started in something like this or how long can they realistically expect, you know, to, you know, pivot like what you did? Like, obviously everyone's different, but like walk, walk me, walk me through what they can do. 
Look, the, the, the most important thing is rather than just jumping in and trying to trade is to learn intensely. Um, with If you only have $5,000 worth of savings, it's, it's kind of hard to pay for a course and have capital left over and make it work. If you have more money than the cost of the education of getting guidance and mentoring is much is a lower percentage, then that's the way to go because that's so much quicker, right? Um, I take students into my my program, the Crypto Success System, and in two weeks they're trading um, systematically with confidence. Like it's it's pretty quick because I've just taken all of the rubbish out, I've given a a very um, clear path of what has to be done, and then they they do that and it works. Um, but if you're going to teach yourself, you need to learn um, learn pretty intensively. Uh, I read dozens and dozens of books b- before I even had a remote chance of being profitable. And there's not that many books on crypto, but I would read books on system- systematic trading, on uh, technical trading and backtesting. Um, because the, the quickest way to know you're going to be profitable is to find a set of rules that work. And the only way to really know quickly if your rules work is to backtest them. Most people will just pick up a book on technical analysis or read some blogs on technical analysis or pick up some software that does TA and go, oh, cool, there's this indicator and there's that indicator and there's this indicator and I put them all in my chart and I'll make my trading decisions and I'll get rich. Like it's not going to happen. You're not. Because all of those things, all of those different indicators contradict each other you've got subjective decision-making. It's going to be inconsistent, right? So you need to combine those indicators into objective rules, test them and validate they actually worked in the past. Because if they didn't work in the past, they're absolutely not going to work in the future. And most people skip that step. They go, well, that's just past data, right? So I want to trade you know, with real money now. So um, this is what XYZ guru says works. So I'm just going to do that because they're rich. I think, well, you know, take a little bit of personal responsibility, validate they actually have worked before. And if they have, then you've got a chance of them working in the future. But if they never worked in the past, they're absolutely not going to work in the future. And I always say to people, if you think you can beat the market, if you think you can be a day trader, just open up a practice account. See what your returns would be. I can guarantee they won't be, you'll be losing money. But that's a great way to get started. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Look, you start that, but don't do it with real money. Most people are so eager that they're so scared of missing out. They just jump in with their savings, whatever their savings are, and they blow up their first account. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's just, I'll just put that down to tuition, right? And I'll save some more money. And then they blow up their second account. And then they was like, okay, well, this tuition's getting expensive, but I'll try again. They save up some more money and then they blow up their third account. And eventually you might get profitable once you learn the lessons. But what's the cost? The cost is you've gone through three blown up accounts or more. You've wasted all of that time and you don't have that capital that you saved up. Like that's gone. Whereas if you'd have invested in your learning first and really thrown yourself into the learning and not like step back from trying to trade and just started to become a trader as in mentally, then you can save all of that money while you're learning and reading and understanding and backtesting. And you start with a bigger account and you go up from there and you don't blow it up. That's really, really critical. So many people uh, come to me and say, well, you know, how's your trading been? And they say, well, not great. I blew up this account and I saved 20 grand. And I lost that. And then I got scanned and this and this and this and this. It's like, man, like so much money. If you'd have just learned first and been conservative not trying to get rich next week, you would have this big account to start with and you'd be making great money. You find that's a lot of pro. I find that a huge problem. Everyone's just looking for get rich quick, but I find that most people who have gone wealthy and have serious money, it's been taking a while, right? Like for you, oh, it, yeah. it took you probably longer than 10 years, right? I imagine. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was I, I was trading longer than 10 years before I left the, co- the corporate world, right? Um, and the thing is you need capital yeah. to, to support yourself. And $5,000 or $50,000 or $100,000 is not enough. I would argue even a million bucks now is questionable. <laughs> Let's be honest. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you've got to be, I mean, it depends on it depends on how much drawdown your strategies are likely to have and how diversified you are, whether you can make money in bull markets and bear markets and so on. But it's more money than you think. 
Like it's definitely high six figures before I would, before I would even consider stepping out of a corporate job and into trading for a living. But most people are coming to the market going, Oh wow, all these people got rich and 10 X their account. And I've got five grand. Can I trade for a living? You can't yet, but if you learn eventually you will be able to. So you've got to be paid. They've got to be patient. And so if, if you're listening to the, to this discussion and you're thinking, I want to be a trader, you should do it, right? But don't expect to be rich next week. Expect it to be a lifelong pursuit that you gradually master. And over time, you build your capital, you build your wealth, and eventually you become free. But it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. That's fairy tales and rainbows. It's just not that way. Yeah, you might see like a, I call them whiz kids or wonder kids, you know, are 25, 30, you become multimillionaires. That's not the normal. Most, no, people, it's not normal. most people, it takes 10, 15, 20 years, right? I think it's been a whole lifetime, you know, becoming yeah. wealthy. And that's what happens. You can't, you can't like race to the top. You know, that's not normal. It's like, to me, it's like the same success as being a professional athlete. If you're not exceptional, you won't get there. Yeah. Like and you, you, you really have to commit to being exceptional. And I love, I love your approach to this because the, the challenge with the modern world, uh, particularly in finance trading uh, with social media, is that that one person who got lucky, they happened to buy XYZ token and it happened to go to the moon in a very short space of time. And now, wow, look, I'm a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever. How many people try to do that and went bust? It's like when you start in a corporate career and you think, you know, I want to be the CEO of Johnson and Johnson, or I want to be the head of an investment bank. And I'm going to make mil tens of millions of dollars a year in salary. Great goal. How many people actually get there? So the people who have become uber successful very quickly are very visible because everyone loves that sort of story. And so they have the massive YouTube subscribers and they have a big, you know, big following and everyone listens to them, but they could have been just lucky. And we don't know. And if you step back from that and you look at the whole ecosystem, all of the traders, the number of people that actually got rich quick is minuscule. The number of people who blew up trying, enormous. And so my philosophy, and I think we're pretty well aligned, which is probably why we're having this chat. My philosophy is that I want a high degree of certainty that I'm going to get and stay wealthy, right? I don't want a very small chance of getting rich and a very high chance of going broke. Like that doesn't do it for me. It's not what I want for my life. If you want that, go buy lottery tickets, go to the casino or, you know, buy penny, penny stocks or, um, you know, new, new, new ICOs or something. And maybe you'll get lucky, but probably you won't. I want certainty that I'm going to get and stay rich. So therefore I have rules that I follow and I limit my risk and I make sure my account's not going to blow up. And over time it just builds. Absolutely. And that's the way to do it, right? Because at some point you've built all this wealth up and then you're like, I want to maintain it more than I want to grow it. Right. Because that's yeah. becomes more important. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, um, you know, objectives is really key here. One of, one of the uh, most underrated steps to becoming a, a professional or a, a full-time trader is having clear objectives written down that suit you, right? Your personality, your objectives, your lifestyle. Um, uh, all of those things are important. Um, my objectives now are very different than when I started trading. When I started trading, I had I started with $7,500 20 odd years ago. And my objective was just to grow it. Like I didn't want to lose it, but I wasn't really fussed about the fluctuations. I just wanted to grow it. I wanted to find a way that I knew that I wasn't going to have to work in the corporate world forever and grow my money. Now I'm much more precise about how much drawdown I'm willing to tolerate. And in a catastrophic event, um, what I'm willing to accept. So if the market crashed 50% tomorrow, like overnight with no chance of getting out, I want to be comfortable that I'm okay that my family is going to be okay. And I have boundaries for that. So therefore I designed my portfolio around those objectives. And that to me is more important than my top line return. But if every trader would actually set their objectives clearly, be honest about it. It's like, yes, everyone wants to get rich, but really how much are you willing to lose to try and get rich? You know, if everyone set those objectives and then design their trading strategy around those objectives, uh, you have a much higher chance of success. 
And I think this is important. This is life advice. I would say it's not limited to just traders. Everyone listening to this, this is like great life advice. <laughs> yeah, becoming a trader is actually brilliant for uh, the rest of life, you know, because the, the ability to think about prob probabilities and likely outcomes and risks and returns and all of that in life is, is really powerful. Like there's things that are fun to do in the moment, but they come with a catastrophic risk potential. And sure, you can say, ah, you know, don't be a tight ass or don't be, you know, don't be so conservative or have a bit of fun or whatever. But, you know, to me, the chance of catastrophic risk is important to consider. You know, I, I don't drive my car at 150 miles now. I don't uh, jump off cliffs. Uh, I mean, jumping off, base jumping would be super fun. I'm not going to do it, right? Because it just doesn't fit with my objectives for my life long term. I'd like to survive. <laughs> and you know, trading is similar. There's lots of great trading. Well, let me retract that. There's lots of trading strategies that look great. Wow, this makes money so consistently. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. This, this is amazing. But you're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. And picking up pennies in front of a steamroller means you're, you're picking up small amounts of money and there's this massive risk looming over you. And if you are trading a strategy that is ultra consistent, very, very smooth returns. You better know what the sting in the tail is. You know, what is that steamroller that's about to run you over? It's like um, a lot of people will make an income trading by selling options, right? Uh, selling um, selling out of the money options for income is a very uh, common way of making smooth, consistent uh, income from the market and replacing your job and quitting and becoming a full-time trader but it's ultra risky because when you're selling out of the money option, it comes with a massive tail risk because if there's a crash in the market, like let's say you're selling puts that are 10% out of the money and there's a crash in the market and you wake up in the morning and the market is 30% down and your puts were only 10% below the market and you sold a whole bunch of them because you wanted to earn more. Guess what? You just blew up. And so consistency of returns is not as important as the consideration of the downside risk. Yeah, and I think another point to add to this is just because you see people driving around Lamborghinis and mansions <laughs> on <laughs> social media, um, that doesn't mean they own them, but they bought them. A lot of people do this for image, right? They rent oh, them, yeah. they rent these mansions. So I vote the people who are truly wealthy, they don't show off their wealth. They don't need to, right? They, why, why would you buy a Lamborghini? When you could have that money in your trading account, that's just stupid. Right? Especially it's when you're early on in your career. Sure. Especially when you're early on in your career. If you're like 35 and have 20, 30 million in the bank, if you buy a Lamborghini, it doesn't affect you at all. Then who sure. cares? But most of these people, there's no way you have that and you're buying no. this stuff. <laughs> no, that's right. You've got to be certain so, social media is very dangerous. You know, when you look at traders, traders on social media and if they're showy, flashy, you know, Lamborghinis and private planes and all of that, they're either ultra risk seeking and they're going to blow up or they're scammers and they've just rented that stuff for the day to make themselves look amazing so that people will give them money. Uh, I, I, There are some traders that have private planes. They're called hedge fund managers. They manage billions of dollars, right? They're uber wealthy. But normal, normal people, like if you are... If you succeed as a trader, you've got a certain mindset and typically they just don't do that stuff. Like no trader who is successful, I know, drives really fancy cars or has private planes or does like it's just not what you would do once you're of that mold. It, it, it's just the mindset of like I call it the business slash financial mindset where you're like that 300,000, 500,000 spending on a car, I could be investing in a business, making a heart, bigger ROI on it than buying that car. So, yeah. so it really needs to be not impacting me at all for me to even consider it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Pete, what, what's in, one of the things that holds people back a lot, I think, is um, having the aspiration for a lifestyle that is a Lamborghinis and private planes and all of that. Like It's ultra expensive, to have a lifestyle like that. And you pay a truckload of depreciation on those things. And so if that's your goal for financial freedom, like you need tens of millions of dollars in your account to, to support that. But you don't need that. 
and it won't keep you happy. Freedom and doing things you love with people that you know you value and treasure that will keep you happy, and that that costs a lot less money. But you still you still need more money in your trading account than you might think. Sadly, so yeah, this is great. But because I think uh, we're saying that the expectations have to be you know set. It's like if you want that type of lifestyle. 20 50 million you're looking at it doesn't matter what currency you choose from basically <laughs> but if you if you want to live in a normal house you know do what you love you still need a lot of money but not nearly that much right yeah i think and look there is so much hype in this industry yeah and uh, thing is i could sell so many more courses if i would just be a bit hypey but i don't i don't i don't want to be i don't i don't want people to come into this environment thinking they're going to be rich next week because like you're not it, it doesn't work that way it's a expertise you've got to build it's a level of confidence that is that takes time and if you come in you, and you have a flash in the pan and you, you you make a lot of money you've got to know how to keep it you don't become a brain surgeon and make millions of dollars a year doing surgery uh, by giving it a crack you know, you go to medical school, you study for years, you do all sorts of training and simulations and all of that. And then eventually you become a brain surgeon, you master it and you make a ton of money. In trading, it's the same thing. You've got to come, you've got to learn, you've got to practice, you've got to survive with a small account so that you can grow to a large account. And here's one piece of advice, which I think is really, really helpful. Sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but there's a lot to get out, right? I've been doing this 20 years and I've seen so many people fail. But most people will trade a small account like they're trying to get rich. And in, in trying to get rich, you force the, you're trying to force the market. And the market is bigger than us. You can't, we, cannot, we cannot force the market. So when we try and force it, something bad happens and you lose a lot of money. But if you trade a small account like it was a big account and like you had to protect it because it was worth protecting, instead of gambling with it. If you trade a small account like it was a big account, one day it will be a big account. But if you trade a small account like you're trying to get rich, it will never be a big account. At least it won't stay that way. So if you want to be a trader who supports himself with your trading, you've got to trade like that person that you want to be. They are conservative. They don't take crazy risks. They don't put it all on black. They don't leverage up. They I don't know anyone who has survived trading long-term that uses a lot of leverage. But most new traders will go, oh, 25 times, oh, 50 times leverage. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> the only time leverage is acceptable is maybe in real estate, but also not extreme leverage. But in stocks and crypto, you're just crazy if you use leverage. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's actually one useful... Um, reason to have and use leverage in crypto and it's to not have all your assets on the exchange so let's say you had 100 grand to trade with do you really want to put your 100 grand on one exchange and hope nothing happens like well probably nothing will happen particularly now rather than earlier but you never know right but what if you put some proportion of that cash on the exchange and use leverage to trade up to your hundred grand. Then you've got money in the bank, like an actual bank, you know, a real bank that has deposit insurance and stuff that's safe. And uh, you've got some of your assets on the exchange and you can trade with it, knowing that you've got this money, which is also your trading capital, but it's preserved. It doesn't, you've got to be careful not to blow up and lose more money than you've got on the exchange. But if the ex something happened to the exchange, you don't lose everything. So that's kind of a sensible use of leverage, I suppose, in, in crypto. But aside from that, the returns are so great from having a good systematic approach, you don't need leverage. All leverage does is increase your risk of ruin. Absolutely. And I think the important thing to point out is in crypto, there's specific risks involved why you're using leverage because exchanges have known to go bust historically. That's why he's using leverage in this case which I think is important to address. It's like, otherwise you wouldn't be using leverage if this wasn't a risk. Mm. Well, I wouldn't because I just don't think you need to. There's enough volatility in the market that a good set of trading rules that's thoroughly tested 
uh, makes a ton of money, like way more money than what you would in stocks using the equivalent sort of rules. In fact, my 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 stock systems applied to crypto with a couple of minor tweaks to account for some structural differences in the market. Um, they make about ten times more in return in crypto than they do in stocks, because the magnitude of the moves in crypto is bigger, and the um, duration of the trends is much shorter. Like they go up much more quickly and they go up further. So you can make much higher returns. So you don't really need the leverage. Yeah, Safety I think, first. And I think another point to differentiate the stock market and the crypto market, the government will backstop the stock market if it tanks. They'll they'll stop freeze trading. They'll do they'll do some crazy stuff. We've seen what they've done during the la the pandemic, 2008, right? They've done some interesting things. But in the crypto, there is no those protections don't really exist. No, that's right. I mean, there's nothing there, there's nothing to um, really intervene in the case of mass panic. Um, I mean, in stocks, you can still have crashes, right? But the chance of a 90% crash in a very short space of time in stocks is probably pretty low. They'll halt it, I'm right? I'm not going to say... Well, They'll the exchange halt. will cease trading. Yeah. And um, the government can adjust interest rates and there's all sorts of policy things they can do. And guess what? There's real companies that make actual money in the stock yeah, market. Exactly. You know, they're not like magic internet tokens that have no real business uh, behind them and no cash flow. And banks right? could go bust, right? Imagine these portfolios that tank 90%. Like you want people's pensions oh, yeah. not coming through. There's a lot of cascading effects that happen with the stock Correct. market going that much down. Yeah. So the downside in stocks, uh, in terms of catastrophic downside is much less than than what it would be in crypto but it doesn't mean you shouldn't trade crypto it just means you have to take that into consideration when you think about how to trade crypto you know we started this whole conversation because we're talking about leverage i don't even use much leverage in stocks a little bit but there's again no need for me because my objectives dictate that the downside is more important than the upside so if i use much leverage then my downside gets too big and i don't want that like that doesn't suit my um long-term plans it doesn't suit my family it doesn't you know my my wife and i have agreed our trading objectives i'm the trader but she's a stakeholder so we okay how are we going to manage our money for the best uh, outcome of our life and we've agreed this is the level of drawdown we're willing to tolerate and this is the sort of return we want to go for and i structure everything around that it's really important to have your objectives clear and to know what you're willing to tolerate on the downside. Don't just think, oh, it'll be okay. So how do you, how do you approach someone who comes to you and says, I don't know what my objectives are. I'm not sure what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. You gotta, you gotta sort of think through the scenarios and I have in, in my stock court, in my um, stock trading program, the trade success system, I have this exercise that you do where it's like a, guided walkthrough sort of not meditation but like a, a guided exercise say so, okay so you've got you've got your account you started with fifty thousand dollars and then this happens and now you've got this much and now this happens and now you've got that much and then it talks through some rat some gains and some losses of different sizes and you've got to you know your feelings when you're visualizing that happening with your wealth and uh there's a point at which you find people are starting to get uncomfortable with the drawdown and that's usually about 15 percent if you can believe it um and that's way lower drawdown than what most people are going to end up with in real-time trading because of you know being aggressive and leverage and all that but as soon as your level of panic when you are thinking about these drawdowns starts to rise that's your tolerance because when your emotion goes up your intelligence goes down and when your intelligence goes down you start making dumb decisions mistakes and you lose money so it's all about observing yourself and thinking through that and not being too bullish on how much you can tolerate because all of us pretty much have a lower tolerance for loss of real money than we think yeah i mean i would say uh, I'm, I've, I think we, we've talked though before and I've said some of my stocks are down 75% and I'm just like, eh, whatever, you know, because that's just, because I have so little invested in there that I'm just like, there's no point in me selling it now, right? I'm just like, I'll just keep it. If it goes to zero, 
whatever. I, I think I put in a thousand bucks in that stock. It's like, I know it might sound a lot of money to people, but in my current position, it's not that much. So, so yeah, it, it all depends on your risk, right? And what you're willing to lose. Because what I always say is don't invest where you're not willing to lose because everyone could invest. Even you could have the perfect system. And for whatever reason, something happens where you lose like 30%, right? It's very unlikely, but there could be that one anomaly that triggers it, right? And mm. you always have to be prepared for that. But yes. but you want to minimize that risk, right? Like I didn't have, like I wasn't ta uh, taking these precautions before when I was investing because I just never seen a bear, a bear market before. Yeah. Now, when you go through one, I will be investing totally differently. Yeah, right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the, one of the most powerful exercises a new trader can do is to um, open up a chart of whatever it is that you're trading and go all the way back. Like if in stocks, you can go back to 1900, right, on the Dow um, and almost that far in the S&P. Um, and you can see, okay, what, what happened? And don't be fooled by the, the growth over time. You actually want to drill in and look at the dips Look at the bear markets. Look how long it took to get back to even. And just really study that because it's great for your perspective of what can happen. And in crypto, probably even more important. Look at the Bitcoin chart and look at it. Don't look at the linear scale. Put it on a logarithmic scale so that that way this massive hockey stick doesn't look quite so exciting and you stop salivating and you start looking at the size of the drawdowns. And really study... How far from peak to trough did the market fall? How long did it take for the market to get back to where it was? How did it move day to day? And just study that because that perspective will really help. If you start trading now and you haven't got that historical perspective, it's pretty hard to make good decisions that'll keep your account alive. But if you go back and really study that history, it helps a lot and it'll calm you down from that whole, I'm going to get rich next week and maybe put a bit of conservatism into your trading so you can survive. That, that's absolutely, that's a great advice even for me, <laughs> considering I've never seen that. But I have actually looked into this and it takes an average three to five years from the peak to trough to get back. And, right. and worst case scenario, it could take a decade or two decades because I think the worst was the 1930s crash. Some people haven't seen returns in 15 to 20 years. So- yeah. Think about it. If your worst case scenario is 15 to 20 years, average case is three to five years. What can you expect? You know, the, the pandemic that we had, that quick drawdown and quick going back up, that's going to be anomaly. Oh, yeah. Major anomaly. Not normal at all. Um, it Well, 2000, 2008, the, um, the global financial crisis, uh, it didn't take that long to recover. But at the time, it still felt long. Yeah. Right? So if you're a... And this is why... Uh, an exit strategy is is so important because you can like in crypto we could let's say you were down that 90 percent in a massive bear market and it took you three years to get back down 90 percent for three years it's pretty hard to maintain that discipline of following your rules every day right but if you have a rule that gets you out and you don't have to sit through the bear market and you just wait till it starts rallying then your drawdown is way lower. You've got much less activity to do. You don't have that kind of gut-wrenching loss that scars you emotionally from making and stops you making good decisions in the future. So probably another advantage for more active trading of having those rules to get you in and get you out. Uh, One of the, actually, I meant to mention earlier, a really cool piece of math, trading math, is um, if you uh, lose 50% of your account, You've got to make a hundred percent return on what's left to get back to where you were. If you lose uh ten percent of your account, you've only got to make a bit over ten percent, like eleven percent, to get back to where you were. So the bigger your drawdown, the harder it is to recover, and the lower the probability you'll ever recover. So keeping those um those account drawdowns to 20, 30, 40 percent and no bigger is really important because it means you can actually recover with a sensible sized rally in the market. But if you're down 80, 90%, it's astronomical returns you've got to make to get back to where you were. And you're, you're gambling that there are going to be astronomical returns in the future and there may not be. What if there's only mediocre returns in the future? You're still way down. So keeping that drawdown low is way more important than most traders think. And that's the importance of diversification, right? You don't want to bet on one stock. 
you don't want to bet on a company long term because like you said how many companies have been around for 100 years name yeah. me a, a handful mm -hmm. coca-cola what how many others you know maybe but no major players yeah so yes diversification is, is super important different stocks or crypto tokens um different strategies long-term strategies short-term strategies trend following strategies mean revision strategies different directions long side short side different markets stocks crypto but not just stocks as in u.s stocks what about australian stocks what about hong kong stocks what about different markets the u.s stock market has been super strong in recent history compared to most others but it's not always that way so the, the new investor could be fooled into thinking, I mean, not now, you're in, we're in a bear market, right? But up until recently, the, the, the new investor could be fooled into thinking, well, US stocks is the only way to go. Like, why would you invest anywhere else? But it's not always that way. You know, there's been plenty of times where the Australian market has way outperformed the US market, just not in recent history. Until this bear market, and the Australian market is down much less than the US market is down. So shorting US stocks, long Australian stocks is pretty reasonable right now. Same thing with Canadian stocks, right? We're a commodity-based right. economy. So commodities are going up. I mean, they've dipped recently, but I think we're still in the bear market. I mean, a bull market in commodities. So Correct. what do you think yeah. is going to happen? Yeah, absolutely. So um, diversifying different strategies, different markets, different timeframes. If you want to, again, as you, wanna, as you grow as a trader, you don't have to do all this on day one, but as you grow as a trader, this becomes really important because it's about really solidifying your portfolio so that it doesn't matter what the market does, you have something that is making you money. Yeah, like the way I describe it is like, you don't want to be a one trick pony. You want to keep adding tools to the toolbox, right? So if some if a tool doesn't work anymore, you have other tools you can pick up. Yes, or if a tool doesn't work right now for this current job, you've got other tools to pick up. That original tool may come back, right? I've got a, um, I've got a, a long side uh, trend following system that I use in the Hong Kong stock market. And uh, it's it's a great system. I really, really like it. It hasn't taken a trade since uh, early 2021. It's been in cash because the Hong Kong market was in a bear market well before the US market because you know, China troubles and everything. Um, so that system made a ton of money in the bull market, then went to cash when, when the market started falling. And uh, I just keep looking at it. No signal, no signal, no signal, no signal. Eventually that tool will turn back on and then it'll make money again but you need other ones to make up the difference. Like in crypto, uh, long side trend following, so making money from the rallies um, worked great until Bitcoin topped. But since then, the, the only real way to make money is to be short. And so, you know, I, I shorted on the way down, again, a dedicated crypto short selling system. And um, that made really great returns. And when you look at the returns from the short system, versus what bitcoin did it's like wow it's like it's amazing yeah absolutely what do you make of the market right now in the current state right like we've been flat for a long time right it seems like we bottomed out we had a little rally what do you what do you see happening yeah um look it's a good question and it's probably on most people's minds um the challenge is we just don't know when it'll stop right so um it looks like it bottomed out and it's had a few test rallies and it's like enough to get everyone hopeful, but I'm a bit skeptical. It's like, it, it could just be another pause before another decline. Um, but the great thing is I don't have to predict because here's what's going to happen. I have like 10 different systems that I trade crypto with. Some of them get long pretty quickly. Some of them get long really slowly at they wait for more and more proof as the market goes up. So on one of those little rallies, I'll get a bit of long exposure. And then if the rally fails, it'll unwind. I'll lose a small amount of money. And if there's another rally, it'll get long again, just in case it keeps going. But then it'll unwind if the rally fails. But then if there's a real rally and it dips and then rallies again and it, you know a, an uptrend has really started, then my other systems will really load up. And so I load up on the long side gradually as there's evidence that it has turned. See, I'm not trying to predict the bottom. You don't have to because the moves in this market are huge. All you need to do is wait for real evidence that it has turned and then get in. And if it 
fails, have a stop loss to get you out. So if it turns and hits your stop loss, you get out. But by buying, trying to predict the bottom, you're just guessing and you've got very little evidence that it's actually turned. When you look at the Bitcoin chart, zoom way out so, and uh, look at the downtrend. It's kind of still a downtrend, but there's this sideways and a few upticks. But those upticks don't look nearly as exciting when you're looking at a two-year chart than compared to how exciting they look when you look at a three-week chart. So if you're looking at a three-week chart thinking, oh, the bull market's over, it's time to get in, zoom way out and your, your excitement will kind of settle down a little bit. <laughs> um, I have no shorts in the market right now. So all my shorts closed out because this sideways consolidation, basically most of them hit their profit targets, a couple closed out with some small losses. But if the market turns down again, the short system will trigger again and I'll go short. Yeah. So if anyone's a, a, trying to time the market right now, you have to bet that the Fed in the US will not keep raising rates. And <laughs> that's basically what everyone seems to be basing their decisions on. And if you're willing to bet, place a bet on that, I'm not willing to because inflation's crazy high. Let's just be honest about that across the world. And mm -hmm. Are they willing to break the economy to kill inflation? I think they are. I think they've clearly shown that. So I think that's going to be the least of your worries, timing the market if they break the economy. Yeah. Uh, look, and, and timing the market with a subjective decision, it's just, it's really, really hard. Like I'm yeah. going to go on a limb and say, impossible to do it consistently in the long term, subjectively. There might be a few unicorns who, you know, kind of really have a feel for how all of this works and just know. But realistically, for, for everyday traders, if you're looking at all of the information you're reading and you're looking at charts and you're listening to the news and you're trying to time a decision to get in, that's a tough gig. But the good news is, like we said before, you don't have to time the market subjectively to make money. What you've got to do is wait until there's evidence the market's going up, then buy. And if there's now evidence the market is going down, sell. And the great thing is trends happen in crypto and in stocks. And if you buy when something is going up, good chance it'll keep going up. And if it keeps going up, you'll make enough money to offset the losses that you make for the stocks or tokens that don't keep going up. So stop trying to time the market subjectively. Just put rules in place that work over the long run. Follow the rules. Life becomes much easier as a trader. All right, so the last question in order to wrap this up, um, do you watch the news at all or do you just abstain from it and look at the data because you find the news manipulates how you think? Yeah, the news is the news is not there to inform. It's there to shock, entertain and sell advertising. Okay, that's it, 100%. Um, and shock and uh, emotion and advertising doesn't help with trading. So early on, I used to watch the news when I started, and this is a long time ago now. So I haven't picked up a newspaper in 15 years, just to give you an idea. And um, I, I haven't turned on the news on the TV for probably almost that time as well. I don't watch CNN. I don't watch any of that because they're not giving information that is helpful. They're giving information to get you to be glued to the screen so that they can sell advertising. They're getting you to be worried about what's going on in the world so that you come back the next day and watch again to get an update so that they can sell advertising. That's all it is. And so like people talk about like Kramer, for instance, and, um, you know, got the mad money show and that those sorts of shows are toxic. It's like, if you're taking guidance about investing from some lunatic on television, <laughs> I mean, he might be a great guy. I don't know him. Right. But I don't watch it. I've seen snippets here and there. It's like, Oh my gosh. People watch this and they make investment decisions based on it. Like, really? There was this video of him cry, you know, crying about um, his Facebook recommendations. Like, dude, that was a screaming sell months ago. The trend was clearly down. If anyone is taking personal responsibility for their trading, they'd be out. And if, you know, so if you've got a set of rules that you follow that you have confidence in, you don't need that stuff. When I eliminated it from my life, guess what happened to my trading? Did it get better or did it get worse? It got better. Because all of a sudden, I'm not second guessing my signals anymore. So when I stopped watching the news, I started sleeping better at night. 
my trading got better. I made less mistakes. I was more consistent following my rules. I made more money. So the only news I really look for is um, news where I need to make a decision about that. Like if a, if a stock I own is being taken over, then I sort of need to know that. And so I'll, I'll monitor for that sort of thing. But I won't click in and read news articles unless it's about something that I need the information, which is very few things. And that, that actually brings up a perfect point, which I have a problem with the media too, is by the time the media covers it, it's already too late. Oh, totally. Because like, I'll give you an example. So we had rent skyrocket here in Canada and I picked up on this in February. And by the time the media covered it, it was the summertime. So think about it. If you were an investor, you would have picked up stuff in February, March, before, once you knew what was going on. And by the time the summer, now everyone knows it's priced in, you're late. Yeah, so, absolutely. Absolutely. And, th and this is why um, systematic trading is, is so powerful, right? Because everything that is known is somehow priced into the chart. I mean, it's, it's not, the markets aren't efficient. Like the, I'm not, I'm not an efficient market sort of person. That's garbage. But um, a lot more is priced in than what you think. And so as the markets start to rally, that's an indication that participants who know something are expecting things to be good. And as the market is starting to fall, the reverse, right? Reading the newspaper and going, oh, that sounds bad. I should sell. Like that, that's um that's not going to be a timely strategy. That's horrible. That's like the worst thing. It's horrible it's the worst strategy. Absolutely. No question. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're gonna get criticized for saying that, but it's true. By the time the media covers it, don't make any decisions then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's there's no there's no decision that you that we have to make in our daily life. That the news is going to inform. I don't. I don't believe. Maybe. Maybe the weather forecast is useful. Okay, but I get that from my app. It's completely emotion free. It's like, oh, it's going to rain today. Good. I'll take a raincoat. That's it. But even that's horribly inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But I'll protect from that downside risk. Right. Ten percent <laughs> chance of rain today. Will I, you know, drive three hours uh, expecting to sunbake at the beach all day? It's like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll probably go, but I might have a backup plan. Or ninety percent chance of rain. Will I go for a walk outside without a rain without an umbrella? Probably not, right? Just you know, protect the downside, just like in trading. Absolutely, I did lie. There's one more question I have. Since oh, you yeah, offer, cool. since you offer this program and course, um, how can people reach out? How can they find you? Uh, give us your details. Yeah, look, the, the the best way is my my website, enlightenedstocktrading.com. Uh, we'll have a, um, a link, I guess, with the show under this video. Um, but if you want to learn more about trading specifically, I've got a bundle of, um, of uh, resources, free course, and some cheat sheets on how to avoid the worst trading mistakes for crypto, which um, I put together for, for your listeners. So that's at um, enlightenedstocktrading.com forward slash crypto leviathan so uh, same spelling as the podcast again link i guess will be below the video somewhere uh and go opt in get that watch the course it'll transform the way you think about trading and read the um the cheat sheets particularly around the trading mistakes because if you can avoid the most common trading mistakes you've got a fighting chance of actually winning and um that's it most people try and win first but address the downside the upside will come and I, I think this will really help. So I hope that's uh, that's useful for everyone listening. Awesome. And do you offer any personal mentorship or is it just through the course? Uh, the, the course has um, mentorship built in. One-on-one uh, -on -one I don't do mainly because I can help a handful of people one-on-one, -on -one, but I've got a great structure set up where I can help much more people uh, in, the, in the, the group course program. And uh, that means I can have a bigger impact on the world. I can help more people get free, you know, all of that rather than a couple of people do really well, a lot of people do really well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm sure our listeners will have great insights from this discussion. I had a ball. Thank you so much for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely.